Thank you, Esther, for queuing up our uh, music to intro day two of our advisor session. Um, elevator music came highly recommended following session one, so we thought we would uh, satisfy the audience and give you all some elevator music. But um, welcome back to day two of uh, virtual DMLC and to the advisor sessions. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, if you joined us yesterday, we introed ourselves, uh, the four of us who are kind of managing the advisor track for this week. Um, so I'm actually going to turn the time over for our panelists to intro themselves. Um, just a quick lowdown for today. So we'll do about 25 to 30 minutes of Q&A with the panelists from the sessions that were released this morning. Um, and then we'll have, again, about 25 to 30 minutes of networking um, amongst you all. Um, so we'll send you into randomized breakout groups um, just to spend some time together chatting about all things DMLC. And we've got some preset questions as well, or you can just utilize that time to network amongst yourselves. Um, but I'm going to turn the time over now for our panelists to intro themselves. So uh, Ms. Casey Carr, if you don't mind kicking us off. Sure, so I'm muting myself. Um, hello, everyone. It's so exciting to see some familiar faces. Um, for those of you that I have not met, though, um, my name is Casey Carr. I was married this past November, so you might have known me as Casey Stein before, but I work for Vanderbilt University Medical Center, supporting um, about five colleges and a little over 10 high schools and a you know, sprinkling of middle schools and elementary schools um, and a couple other student programs that are non-CMN for our Nashville market. So I'm really excited to be here and help answer any questions. Awesome, thanks. Megan, if you wanna jump in. Hi everyone, I'm Megan and I work for the University of Iowa so Family Children's Hospital. Um, we have about 16 college dance marathon programs, and I work pretty closely with 15 of them. Um, and then I also work with our Extra Life program and just a few other kind of odds and ends here and there. Um, I've started this role about a year and a half ago, so I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, our IUPUI team. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back at DMLC. My name is Pete Hunter, and I work for the Indiana University Foundation on the IUPUI campus. Um, and I have the privilege of serving as the co-advisor to our dance marathon, Jagathon. This is um, coming up on, um, I've just finished my eighth year um, working with the program in March. Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Imsweiler. I co-advise Jagathon with Pete on the IUPUI campus in Indianapolis. Um, and this is my fourth DMLC, but it's my first as an advisor, so I'm really excited to be here with you all. Awesome, thanks, and welcome to your first uh, advisor track. Um, cool, well, we will go ahead and um, jump in with some Q&A. So just as a reminder, um, the sessions for the, the three uh, or the four panelists covered for this that was released yesterday was high school acquisition, which was covered by um, Casey at Vanderbilt Children's, providing a meaningful student leadership experience through the lens of giving back, which was our IUPUI team. And then we're all in this together, which was Meg at uh, University of Iowa Stead Children's Hospital. So um, just as a reminder, those are the ones that were released this morning, but we will open up the floor now. Um, we will ma uh, monitor the chat. So if you wanna post them in chat, you can, or you're just welcome to unmute yourself and ask any questions of any of the panelists. Who's going to take the first question? Cool. I'll kick it off and then hopefully we'll get some questions followed up from there. Um, so for Casey, I would love to hear um, just what would you say? I know your presentation was awesome about high school acquisition um, for some of our program directors that may be newer to their roles, what would you say is step one um, that you've seen success with in the high school acquisition process if you're starting with a completely blank slate? Sure. Um, so when I started at Vanderbilt Children's, 
we did not have any existing high school program, so it was pretty new for us as well. And the very first thing we did was kind of figure out what all of our student-related activities were from toy drives to dance marathon and everything in between and put together like a menu of options. And then the second thing we did was figure out what warm leads existed within our hospital. So um, if you tuned into the session, I gave a few examples, but we have um, like an internship program through our child life team. We have a really strong, robust adult program. Um, so we used them to reach out to kids and then just alumni within our own offices of local schools that were willing to make recommendations. And I think by taking to them just this range of options of ways they could get involved um, made them feel more comfortable, like they weren't diving into something really extensive. But without fail, the students got most excited about Dance Marathon. And so that's the path most schools chose. So that was kind of our step one and two. Awesome. Thank you. Um, looks like we've got some good questions now rolling into the chat. Um, I think the next two are um, for Pete and Allie. So we'll start with um, Kara's question. How do you support a team leader who is really a great person and quite dedicated, but is also competitive and demanding in a way that could be discouraging and upsetting to more sensitive individuals? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think um, in my time um, working with the students, I think, you know, at, at the beginning of our presentation, we talked a little bit about all the various reasons why our students get involved and that it's not just sort of a one size fits all kind of a program. There's lots of reasons why a student might, uh, might want to get involved in your dance marathon. And I think sometimes it's important that you bring that to light even for your student leader. So you have that student who maybe is super competitive and they're really about you know, maybe it's all about the number for them and, and improving. And then you've got other students that um, they really love the cause, they like the connection with the families or any number of different things. I think first and foremost, making sure that your, your leadership group understands where everyone's coming from. I think it's part of the onboarding process when they get to know one another is to kind of tell, like from our perspective, our hospital is uh, Riley Hospital for Children. So to kind of deliver that, you know, your personal Riley inspiration, like why am I here? What drew me to this? What kept me here? What made me want to join this leadership team? I think that helps the students to kind of get an, a sense for like what their, what their peers, why their peers are there, which helps them to kind of modify their behavior a little bit. But I think if that sort of conditioning doesn't work, sometimes you have to have the conversations with the students to kind of say, you know, here's what you said, or here was your approach. Could you maybe see how that might have been received by this student or you know it could be taken this way or do you you know sometimes i think people um kind of fall into their habits and don't necessarily know um how they're being portrayed how people are receiving kind of what they're putting out and i think sometimes you just have to make them aware that you know if you're not trying to make people think this way about you you might want to change your approach and talk to them about ways that they can rethink the way in which they convey themselves i don't know if that's helpful yeah, I agree with that a lot and kind of in general reminding them that we're all here for the same goal, even though we might have different motivations for why we participate. So I think reminding them of that is an important thing too. And then also remembering, I guess, as advisors that some of the students, a lot of them actually are here because it is a learning experience. So kind of keeping that at the heart of the conversations too, you know, when you provide that tough love, I guess, to them that, you know, you're only trying to make them better for future for future instances that they're going to be interacting with people. So um, I think coming at it from a few different angles is, is going to be key. Awesome. Thanks. And this next one is for both of you as well. Um, so in your presentation, you talked about Dance Marathon being helpful for students uh, for their resumes and job interviews. Would love to just hear, um, as far as collaboration on your campuses, did you collaborate with your career centers department to offer workshops or trainings for your students? Yeah, so with that, so you may have seen in the presentation that Jagathon offers a three credit hour course to um, the students on the Jagathon executive board. So um, this past year, we kind of tried to develop out those class sessions a little bit. Um, with COVID, things got a little bit interesting, but we were planning on having with our Office of Student Employment um, 
a session on resume development and interview skills that was, you know, specific to how the students can utilize their dance marathon experience on their resume and in an interview. So um, that's a partnership that that we've built in the past year and that we're hoping to continue um, as we proceed throughout the year. Um, something that this isn't um, directly on the campus, but we have our alumni chime in from time to time at the exec meetings and at the committee meetings from, you know, how Dance Marathon has shaped their career path and helped them to um, obtain the roles that they have now. So we've come at it from a few different ways. I have a quick question for Allie and Pete. Um, this goes back, obviously, Dance Marathon is a huge part of everything that you guys do but I know that you have jobs and responsibilities outside of this. How do you balance the other responsibilities of your role with your dance marathon advisor role as well? Yeah, that, that, um, that's the million dollar question. Uh, it's a great question. So I think, you know, for me, I kind of have to compartmentalize um, the things that I need to do versus the things that I want to do. And I make sure that I um, use my sort of 40 hour work week um, to ensure that I can get done the things that I must get done, those meetings that, you know, that have to happen, those, um, you know, standing meetings that happen every week or every month or every two weeks or what have you, and the certain functions that must take place. But then there's a lot of other things that I also view from my perspective. There are things that um, I'm, I'm not really doing it to get a paycheck, if that makes sense. And so I'm willing to, you know, meet after hours or, you know, have meetings at, you know, late or, or on the weekends. I don't necessarily know that that's the greatest approach, but from my perspective, it's trying to find a balance knowing that when your program gets to a certain size, you cannot be there for everything. And I feel like there's sort of a pool of things that I have to be there for, or I'm, you know, maybe, you know, not taking care of my, my duties and my responsibilities appropriately. And then there's some other things that are just genuinely enjoyable for me that I don't want to miss. So I try to find time for those pieces of it. And also know that, you know, my boss is, you know, I want to keep her happy. So I got to do all the other stuff she wants me to do too. And we're pretty transparent on these focus areas with the student leaders as well. You know, they're going to know when we're going to be in certain meetings, you know, be it with a campus partner or um, something like that. They, they know when to expect us at those sorts of things, but they also know when they have more of the autonomy to, you know, give the green light on certain things. So we're pretty forthcoming with, you know, the president and VPs. That's how we're structured. So. It's kind of how we manage that. Thanks, y'all. Um, going to jump in with a few questions from the chat. Um, so we have one from Amy. Have any of you had success in engaging with your students with this transition to all things virtual and throughout the summer months? Um, this really can be for any of our panelists. Um, so if any of y'all want to jump in with any successes you've had engaging online. We've had a lot of luck. I mean, I can say that it, for this time, it's usually a dead zone for us um, to some extent because, you know, we're post-event, um, graduations just happened. You know, usually we're kind of isolated to our executive board transition, and even that has a pretty slow cadence. But I can say in, in my time, we've never had more engagement during this time period than right now because our students are really craving the, you know, interaction with each other, and they're looking for things that to, to do that, have meaning and I think that anything that you can do to make those things possible, my experience right now has been the students will probably take you up on it. I, I have a couple quick examples. Um, I'd love to hear from Megan though too, but we've, um, we used to do like a kickoff for all of our high schools in September and with COVID and not knowing when our hospital would open its doors again to visitors, we decided to kind of transition the, the mini DMLC in September, if you will, into a series of webinars. And so uh, we actually have an intern right now who went to Butler, shout out Riley, and she's organized and hosted about eight um, webinars focusing on various different topics in our our newer college programs and our high schools have found those really useful. Um, and about a year ago, we actually transitioned to using Zoom a lot for our meetings just because it helped reduce travel costs. And so even our Vanderbilt students who are mentoring our, college, our high school students have been using 
you know, FaceTime or Zoom. And so there wasn't really a big difference um, or it wasn't really a hard transition. It, it kind of felt really normal to keep talking this way and they were familiar with it. So um, those of you who are maybe hesitant to start using Zoom for all your meetings, although everyone probably is, um, I feel like it's been more effective and um, hasn't felt weird, which is what I think all the high schoolers are as well. Yeah, I would say coming from a hospital standpoint, the biggest challenge that I've faced is not being able to bring students into the hospital um, because this is really the time of year, later spring, early fall over the summer where we're trying to get our exec teams in so that they can see it and take photos. Um, so a few of the things that we've been trying to transition and doing virtually is just creating a hospital tour and I can hop on a Zoom with them and walk them through the hospital, share the fun stories, all the statistics and fun facts. Um, but another thing that has really been a bummer is because we have 16 programs and they could be as far as three hours apart from each other, we want to give them the opportunities to network and meet one another. Um, and so normally we would be doing that at DMLC. We take a big bus normally or we would all fly together. Um, so I just offered to do like a Zoom hangout for all of our teams this week so that they can kind of get to know one another, start talking about some of the ideas that they've heard this week. Um, we're planning to hold an executive director meet and greet later this summer, maybe early fall, um, just so that they can get some of those conversations going. Um, and then kind of the other biggest thing I would say transitioning virtually for us is we typically hold a all Iowa program uh, retreat in the fall. So it's basically like a mini DMLC, but for all the programs who benefit our hospital. And so we're really looking on how we can, instead of bringing everyone to our hospital and doing it in person, how we can do it virtually, similar to how we're doing DMLC right now. So it's definitely been interesting. Um, and it's been a lot of listening on our part too. Everyone's just really taking it day by day. So I try and just hear feedback from students, what challenges that they're facing, um, and how we can take it day by day since so much is still uncertain right now. And a uh, real quick follow-up um, for Megan and Casey. I know something that came up earlier in the Advisor Discord channel is somewhat related to this um, in terms of suggestions for virtual hospital tours or the ways we can interact with our families or help our students interact with families while we're in our virtual spaces. So if either of y'all have any thoughts on that, would love you to share. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so like I mentioned, we are trying to create a virtual hospital tour and the one that was shared of Salt Lake City is, is really nice and really well done. Um, and so if we could do something like that, that's something that could continue in perpetuity after we're hopefully allowed back in the hospital as well, just to send out to um, all of our Dance Marathon programs. They can share them on their social channels if they want to share them at big dancer meetings or at the opening of their big event, whenever it may be, um, it would just be a really nice tool and resource for them to have. Um, and since, you know, we've all started quarantining, um, I've been working with different families just to get clips of them, you know, saying they're thinking of the students or getting pictures or artwork or whatever it may be. Um, and that's actually been a, a thing our whole team is working on that we can share with corporate partners as well. Um, and we've also found ways to engage our foundation's president just to share like some wise words from her that everyone's in this together. And um, though we know that these days and weeks and years or next year is going to look pretty different, we're still right there with you. We appreciate everything that they're doing and um, the same kind of communication from families as well, just that they love having the students around whether or not they can be together in person. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think we're just trying to still meet with them and engage them the same ways we're engaging the students by, you know, having families pop into Zoom calls and share their story um, or send videos. We were doing a lot of this before. And so again, luckily it hasn't um, really changed that much. Uh, we are restricted on how our families can participate based on like our hospital's restriction for employees. So until our employees are allowed to be traveling again and visiting and we're back to the office, we can't invite our Miracle Ambassadors. So we're kind of up in the air. Um, if there is an on-campus for our colleges, whether or not the Miracle families will be there. So I think we're going to 
start really investing in some of those virtual videos of their stories being told. And um, we're also working on a hospital tour video. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any great ideas, we are definitely open here in Vanderbilt. Awesome, thank you both. Um, several questions, and I know this was a hot ticket item last year at DMLC. So Ali and Pete, um, several questions in the chat about how this class came about, how did you land this on your, um, at IUPUI, um, is it a three credit course, um, which the students attend, what's covered, who teaches it, all of the, all of the questions about um, the course, if y'all wanna kind of dive in and, and chat about how that came to fruition. Sure, I'll kind of chime in real quick with the framework and then I'll let Allie fill in all the important stuff. Um, but this came about, I don't know, about three years ago, and it was just kind of uh, a recognition, and many of you probably have um, probably experienced this yourself, where whichever semester your main event is at, your executive board is probably putting more effort into your dance marathon than they are any course that they have. Uh, it just requires that much and they care too much. And so it was sort of an acknowledgement that, wait a minute, they're putting all this time and effort in experientially. They're pulling all these outcomes out that are translatable uh, experientially to the professional world. Why can they not get course credit? And I think a lot of it is because our colleagues on, um, you know, university campuses, they don't understand uh, these programs unless you tease it out and show what those outcomes are. So uh, basically what, what we ultimately came up with our meetings have historically for us been Sundays from uh, the magical time has been like 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. every Sunday year long for our executive board. And it's literally because it's the only time where we know we don't have to put out some sort of a poll to figure out when people can meet. They're always available to meet at that time. And so basically with a, a three credit hour course through our university, it requires meeting once a week for two hours and 45 minutes. And so what we went to the, um, the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, and I think it also fits really well with any sort of a nonprofit management program that you might have on your campus as well. I think we would have gotten course credit even if we had gone that route instead of philanthropy. Um, but basically we, we put a kind of the, a proposal together and said, look, the, here's what our students are taking from this experience. Here's the kind of work that they put in. What we wanna do is we wanna extend those weekly meetings by 45 minutes. And what we'll do is we'll incorporate weekly guest lecturers. So Allie and I serve as the instructor of record for the course. We continue to have our two hour long weekly Sunday meetings. And then we add to begin those Sunday meetings, a 45 minute guest lecturer. And so leading into it and they're topical to dance marathon to help you know, these students think, okay, they're practitioners, they know what works, but they don't always know the why of it. And to try to help fill in some of those gaps. So for instance, one of our guest lecturers uh, Kristen Sheard. She is our, our national CMNH rep. She'll, she'll serve as one of our guest lecturers for one of our class sessions, and it'll be on peer-to-peer -peer online fundraising. And so we'll have a peer-reviewed article on peer-to-peer -peer online fundraising that the students will read leading into that class. And then that guest lecturer will speak for 45 minutes, and then we'll have our two-hour long meeting. And so we have various topics. You know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, preparing, you know, resume building and how you translate the experience to um, an interview, things like that. But also everything from, you know, um, um, Andrew, Andrew Stallings, he's our, our uh, Riley Children's Foundation liaison, and he helps us bring in a representative for their donor society. And so we'll have our students read a peer-reviewed article on donor societies, and then our Riley representative will come in and talk about how our program can fit into um, the donor society, you know, so everything fits together so that, you know, the, the guest lecturers and the readings fit in with what we're doing experientially and don't add a lot of extra work for the students, but hope to deepen their understanding of the work that they were already going to do, and then they get course credit for it in essence. I don't know if I missed anything super important there, Allie. Uh, no, I think, I think you covered it. As far as the assignments go, we've tried to get a little bit more, um, creative with those so it's you know applicable to the work that they're doing that semester um, we have community engage or uh, committee engagement plans rather um, that they are to construct for the semester leading up to the event how they're going to keep their committees engaged what does that look like from literally the emails that they are sending out um, the group me messages the text to the meetings that they have planned and bonding events that sort of thing to really get them thinking about how to give 
their members a good experience. And then their um, peer to peer fundraising plans for push days that we have that semester. So it's definitely not busy work by any means. Um, it's stuff that they can use throughout that semester and transitions well into the next year also. And the guest lectures, um, we've established some pretty great relationships there as far as our, you know, we have some sponsors who come in and talk about you know, we have a partnership with the local running event, the Indianapolis Monumental Marathon, and they have volunteer engagement as a huge priority for such a large scale event. So we bring them in and they talk about how to manage a team and that sort of thing. So that and the relationships that it's allowed us to establish with faculty on our campus has been really, really valuable um, for the class, but also just for the program as well. Thank you all. Um, and then uh, another one uh, for Casey and Megan, if y'all have um, any advice for how to maintain and grow partnerships with sponsors who are facing financial cuts and strains due to COVID-19. Not like that's, you know, a big question or anything. <laughs> million dollar question. <laughs> so yeah, that is a million dollar question. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've really been encouraging our programs to work on right now is just building that relationship and maintaining a relationship before getting concerned about monetary values or what their partnerships can provide for them and what they need to provide in return. It's more of just checking in with them, seeing how they're doing, making sure that they know that, uh, you know, the students are thinking of them in the hard times, that they're, if it's a restaurant, going out to eat at their restaurant or shopping in their stores, um, whatever it may be, just to kind of build that relationship without putting any monetary or um, whatever, like value to it necessarily. Um, and as things go day by day, I think there'll be a lot of opportunities for them to transition into doing things like instead of coming to potentially table at an event or something, if they can just let a sponsor pop into their meetings, to their exec team meetings or dancer meetings for a little bit, um, or vice versa, if the sponsor could hang a flyer in their business or hand out little cards with information about Dance Marathon, um, that kind of thing. But I think there's definitely going to be a shift as we move forward. Yeah, I want to give Vanderbilt a shout out. I, they had a really thoughtful idea kind of at the beginning of COVID to compile a list of all their past sponsors, caterers, businesses, and um, they've been giving updates on how you can continue to support them, whether it's by give, buying gift cards, ordering food to go. And I thought that was a really natural way, to your point, Megan, of supporting them, even if they, you know, most of our Vanderbilt students don't live in Nashville, they go back to Chicago or Boston or Texas or California, and so they're not even here locally, but that was a way that they could continue to support them. Um, I also think, you know, I'm sure a lot of the hospital advisors on this call have learned this, that with COVID, there has been kind of a lot of companies coming out of the woodworks for us that have been able to sustain or maybe even grow through the quarantine, and they're looking for opportunities to give back and support. Um, one of these examples is our athletic partnership. Um, a lot of the coaches have, you know, they're not really a company, but the coaches have been wanting to know how they can get involved and by supporting their student athletes fundraising team. And so it's also a great opportunity for your students to revisit some partners that have maybe said no in the past or go back to their prospect list or go to their committees and figure out, you know, where those warm leads are throughout their companies. I'm sure those of you who work with high schools understand that most of those sponsorships come from people's parents. And so I am curious to see how that maybe shifts and changes. I'm anticipating less of those gifts. Um, but again, it's an opportunity to expand your participants and refocus on, you know, the grassroots of Dance Marathon, the individual P2P fundraising. Um, and, you know, we might not need catering if there's no in-person events. So we can get creative and partner with Uber Eats or something instead. So I guess we're all kind of figuring it out as we go. Awesome, <laughs> love that response. Hopefully we need catering, but, um, well, just wanted to say thank you again to the panelists. I know that was quick. Um, so just want to remind everyone we have the Discord channel. So if you have additional follow-up questions for the panelists or just in general um, about anything and everything campus or hospital related, 
feel free to drop those in any of the three advisor discord channels.